join Forum IS Academy, trusted by hundreds of toppers, including IS Rank 1 Shruti Sharma. Hello friends, this is Vijay. Welcome to Forum IS Hindu Daily. In our today's news discussion, we will be seeing the topics. Uh, the first topic it is related to the, the SDG. So it came in the editorial part. Then the second one, it is about the labor rights. So you all well known today, May 1st, it is for the labors. So that's what the article came. Then the third one, it is about the research on the copper plates. And it had revealed some facts about the Shilabhatrika and the Chalukyan kingdom. Then the fourth one, it is related to the international relations and Rajnath to hand over patrol vessel landing craft to Maldives here in this topic. We are not going to discuss much about the Maldives and the Indian relations but here we will be seeing about the mapping okay with respect to the Indian Ocean region. Then the last one it is about the FRA Act. Lives of 600 villagers set to change for better in Odisha. It is related to the Forest Rights Act 2006. And here we will be discussing certain provisions, significances and challenges related to the FRA Act. The significance for each topic had been given. So kindly make a note. Now without any delay, let us dive into the article part. The first one, as I told you, it is related to the SDG. Then the second one, it is for the labor rights. Then the third one, it is about the copper plate or descriptions. Then the fourth one, this is the article related to Maldives and this is the last one and this is related to the FRA Act and kindly go through the article let's start the discussion guys in this article let us have a brief recap on what is mean by sustainable development and what are sustainable development goals okay so sustainable development you might have known about the Brentland report right Brentland Commission report the report name is our common future so it came in the year of 1987. Our common future is the report name. So it was the report of Brentland Commission. There actually they discussed about the sustainable development for the first time. There actually they insisted that the development which meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own needs. So without compromising the future needs if we are satisfying our own needs means it will be termed as a sustainable development and sustainable development actually it calls for concerted efforts towards building an inclusive sustainable and resilient future okay so the inclusive the term inclusive is very important with respect to the sustainable development the growth what we are going to achieve it should be for all not for the particular sections or particular caste or particular community etc so that's what the term inclusive is mentioning and sustainable development goals they are a set of 17 global goals and that all are interlinked and they are designed to serve as a blueprint for the future so this is what the aim of the sustainable development goals and these sdg goals they are developed by the un general assembly so un general assembly was the mastermind behind the sdg goals and they designated in the year of 2014. So in the year of 2014, UNGA released the SDG goals and the targets, what they envisioned in the SDG goals, they are supposed to be achieved by 2030. So 2030 was the target for the SDG. And you all well known Agenda 2030, right? So Agenda 2030 is a UNGA resolution, okay? So where the sustainable development goals and all got incorporated. So this is what Agenda 2030. It is a UNGA resolution. It incorporates the goals what we had envisioned under the SDG. And the aim of the SDG, this is the very popular uh, term transforming the world. So this is the aim of the SDG. And guys, with respect to this article, PM Prime Minister Modi, he himself expressed certain concerns about the progress what we had achieved in the SDG. So recently in the G20 summit also he expressed certain concerns and lot of parameters and goals are well behind the predicted progress 
and all these goals are supposed to be achieved by 2030. So 2030 is the deadline for sustainable development goals but still we hadn't achieved what we are supposed to achieve by 2030. So in this article the author expresses the progress and delays with respect to the SDG and he had provided certain suggestions correlating with with the measures what we had taken during the COVID-19 because India was doing well in the pandemic time so that's what the author have been taking certain cues from the lessons what we learned from the COVID-19 and here with with respect to the India's progress is mixed India is doing well in certain targets those are here they had given under 5 mortality rate and the full vaccination and improved sanitation and the electricity access. In all these goals, we did a considerable progress in the last five years. But there is an inequality in the performance among the districts. And almost all the districts, they actually did something in these targets. And in certain indicators like eliminating adolescent pregnancy, then reducing multidimensional poverty, then this is the last indicator, women having bank accounts. And here in India, we are having Jandan Yojana for promoting the bank accounts and the financial inclusion. And here in these indicators, we improved a bit, but we had to achieve a massive uh, goals under these targets. And there are also another category of indicators like a clean fuel. So clean fuel for cooking is the another one indicator where almost two thirds of the districts are of the target. So two thirds districts, they hadn't achieved the determined target in India. Here the sorrow state of affairs is, so far no single district in India had eliminated the practice of child marriage. So we all well known, we, the government have been taking enormous measures related to the elimination of child marriages. But in India, still the child marriage is highly prevailing. Therefore, with respect to SDG, India's performance is mixed. And with respect to the lessons from the COVID-19, the writer says that India should take clues from COVID-19 in eradicating the lacuna with respect to the performance of SDG. Firstly, he states that there should be a district level plans and missionaries to achieve the SDG. In COVID-19, you might have known PM himself had taken certain DMs in line who are underperforming and with respect to the eradication of both COVID-19 and the vaccination. Okay, at the time we were also doing the vaccination. So PM, he himself had taken certain district magistrates in line and he discussed about the progress what they are doing. Okay, so the same action plan, it should be implemented to achieve the SDG goals. This is what the writer have been mentioning in the suggestion number one. Then the government, it should go for real time measure of the progress. This is also the same what we had done in the COVID-19 lockdown and here the writer have been insisting that it should design the coordinated public data platform for population health management so that the everyone from union, state and district missionaries, they can devise the action plan in such a way to achieve the targets. So this is the aim of the uh, second lesson. Thirdly, he is calling for the relief packages. You all well known in COVID-19 lockdown, the government came up with the various relief packages in the year of 2020 and in 2021, in which government came up with a lot of uh, uh, welfare measures, which actually engaged the scale of eliminating the COVID-19. So he insisted that to achieve the SDG, the government should also come up with the, the relief packages, what it had implemented in the COVID-19 timeline. So these are all the few things the author have been insisting in this article and here we can incorporate these three suggestions in the main answer. Suppose if they are asking for measures to be taken with respect to the SDG means we can incorporate that. After 2014, almost all the schemes were designed by keeping SDG as a basic tenet of it. You can see some seams like uh, Jantan Yojana, then Swachh Bharat Abhyan, then Stand Up India scheme, Beti Bachao Beti Badao right so these all measures they actually incorporated the tenets of sdg and here i had given some uh, value additions so these are the other measures we can take the first one changes in the production and the consumption pattern you all well known 
the developed countries they need to change their production and consumption patterns including by limiting the use of fossil fuels and plastics and to they should encourage the public and private investments that align with the sdg so this is the other measure we can take then with respect to the environmental commons such as atmosphere rainforest then we are having antarctica okay this all regions need to be safeguarded as a crucial source of ecosystem so they need to be protected then the last one the food system it must undergo changes because today almost 80% of the water is getting utilized in the agricultural system so it actually uh, it is the right time to implement the changes in the infrastructure through the cultural and the societal norms so we need to change the entire food and agrarian system therefore it will aid us to achieve the sdg goals what we are determining for so with this note let us wind up the article number 1 and in the conclusion the writer states that india should evolve a innovative policy the, uh, that is very important guys right now we are having a staggering 130 crore population right no country is having the population what our country is hosting so we can't take any best practice from anyone because no one is having this much population therefore we should evolve the best practices with respect to the sdg to the entire world so this is what the writer have been insisting in the conclusion part so that's it guys let us dive into the next article and this is the article kindly go through it guys you all well known about the factors of production i hope so let me write here the first one land then the second one labor then the third one capital okay so these are all the few factors of the production and the labor is also one among them it emphasizes the importance of labors in the production system today in the globalized world each and every mnc is looking forward for cheap labors so you all well known about the history behind the china in transforming their landscape as a factory of the entire world all it goes to cheap labor because they are having enormous labor source so their labor cost is very low in china compared to the counterparts and every mnc these days they are looking up for a cheap labor as a major determinant in establishing their entities let's come to the article today it marks may 1 so it marks the entitled months what labor community got through the chicago demonstration of 1886 so in this demonstration they got the entitlement of 8 hours per work day and weekly the laborers can work for 48 hours to the max if the laborer is working beyond this time limit means he is supposed to get add on salary in the form of overtime dues so but today several competitions are there especially among the labor uh, labor people let's take us for example why it want indian it exports so because indian it personnel will work for more time compared to the us counterparts at the minimal cost this is the reason actually they are hiring indian exports when covid 19 hit several states they had amended the factory act using the ordinance route so it had been given in the article itself because at that time there was no economic growth and there was economic stagnation but recently karnataka and tamil nadu they were came up with amending the labor laws to enhancing the working time to 12 hours a day so even though the tamil nadu they withdrew the its proposals after facing the huge protest why they are amending the laws what is the key motive behind this scene the simple answer is to attract the investments from the mncs so if mncs are doing investments means then there will be a demand for labor and the employment promotion center will be happen so you all well known today almost all the state governments they are doing certain populist measures for enhancing the employment and these days you might have known in apparel and textile segments and then in electronics india facing enormous competition from bangladesh and vietnam so this is also the author have been mentioning here and what is the reason behind this one and only reason is guys cheap labor so because of the cheap labor only both bangladesh and vietnam have been 
providing edge in the governments and in the electronics sector but in the develop but in the name of development is it right to push the people to work above their limits because human body is not designed to work above 8 hours a day you all well known and moreover all the laborers are also having family and they also might be needing certain recreational activities so these are the few things we need to keep in mind and here we need to ask ourselves one question do we need to become either us or like bangladesh because people these days you all well known they have been expecting better life standards and work life balance so amending laws to work for 12 hours will invite the wrath from the labor community recently in the global right index here it is mentioned it was launched by the international trade union uh, confederation they actually ranked bangladesh in the top 10 worst countries where labor rights are not guaranteed do you know what it mean in bangladesh the laborers are getting exploited they are not living the standards of what the other developed and developing counterparts are living they don't have right remuneration they don't have proper health care do we need these things to be done to the labor force in our country we should ask ourselves right so eyeing on the gdp and meanwhile exploiting the people wouldn't be a right option the growth should propel the human development else the growth what we are achieving is futile it is of no use to the country or any of its citizens if the growth it didn't bring the development means so this is what we should know and the developed countries especially like uh, scandinavian countries they are focusing more on the welfare orientation they are highly productive compared to the developing counterparts in india bangladesh and in china these days certain countries like japan and all they came up with sleeping rooms in the premises in the office or premises sleeping rooms will be provided so if the employees are uh, feeling sleepy means they can take a nap in the sleeping rooms so they actually predicted that it have been enhancing the productivity but with respect to india till today we couldn't able to ensure the space for lactating women in office premises so then they also discussed about several challenges what we are facing like that they had given and here they had given by amending the working time we are setting the clock back to the 18th century because in the 18th century uh, especially during the industrial revolution only we were having the working time of 12 hours now it is the time of fourth industrial revolution if we are reverting back to 12 hours a day means we are setting the clock back to 18th century like that they have been quoting and here you also well known if the employees are becoming aging means they will be less efficient and they will be highly fatigued and they are prone to industrial accidents also so this also one important point you should know we may set the gdp to 5 trillion dollar economy but we should also taken care of the workforce too right else the so called demographic dividend they will turn to your demographic trauma let us discuss briefly about the issues in labor laws okay here some other issues are also had given and these are all the few issues you can quote it in the answer the first one is related to the complex law system okay so the article it actually ended here this is a value addition part under the constitution of india the labor the subject labor is here concurrent list where both the labor where both the central and the state governments they are competent to enact the legislations so labor is a it is in the concurrent list as a result large number of labor laws have been enacted catering to the different aspects of labor example the occupational health then employment safety so actually it created a lot of redundancy and loopholes in the legal system so these loopholes it actually paving the way for exploitation of labor so this is what the complex law system have been tending towards the laborers and the next one the labor exploitation because of the predominantly heavy handed labor regulations also it is termed as a uh, actually i have been uh, stating about the inspector raj government okay so today the mncs and the domestic organizations they have resorted now let us discuss about the other issues related to the labor laws the first one 
the complex law system you all will know the term labor it is a it is in the, the subject is in the concurrent list so both the state government and the central government they can enact multiple laws so these multiple laws they actually providing loopholes for the exploitation and the second one labor exploitation in india you all well known we are having huge labor resources and mnc's who are doing investments in india they are actually capitalizing this uh, enormous resources and they are doing the exploitation in a massive scale and the impact of delay of labor reforms guys actually labor reforms it is a very dynamic part so the labor reforms if not implemented soon means it would take a gross hit on india as a investment destination so this is the main issue we are facing today then you all well known the contract labor because by signing the contracts the mnc's they actually have been reaping the potential of the labor and they are using the contract labor for their whims and fancies and with respect to the apprenticeship in india we don't have any proper structure for the apprenticeship and all actually our education system is not responsive to the needs of the market therefore the apprenticeship and the apprenticeship it need to be strengthened because if the guys are doing if the labor force is doing the apprenticeship means it will enhance their skills and it will enhance the productivity of the industries also so these are the few issues we are facing with respect to the labor laws and if the government is going to enact some new laws or code means they should come up with the resolutions for these issues now with this note let us move on to the next slide this is the third article kindly go through it so here why in news actually boring which houses the south asia's largest collection of manuscripts and rare text recently embarked on a mission after which they claim to have shed new light on shila patrika so the copper plates decoded by the pune based bandarkar institute it actually shed some light over the the capability of shila patrika with respect to the poems and here with respect to the charter the copper plate charter it dated from the time of chalukyan ruler vijay aditya the charter it had five plates measuring some 23 into 9 cm uh, it is actually a rectangle form so 23 meter 23 cm length and a 9 cm width so it actually incorporates the beautiful varaga seal so varaga seal it is a trademark of the chalukyan rule and the charter it actually contained a sanskrit text total of 65 lines they all were written in the brahmi script so this is what it had been given this is the brief description about the charter and now let us discuss about the shila patrika so the inscriptions on uh, pune copper plates it establishes the poetess as a chalukyan princess shila patrika is a daughter of chalukyan ruler pulakeshin 2 he is a very important ruler and he actually defeated the harshavardhan of kanauj in the battle near the banks of narmada river in the year of 618 bc okay 618 c so it's a battle of narmada where pulakeshin 2 defeated the harshavardhan he is a ruler from kanauj and this decipherment it actually revealed shila patrika as a poetess in the indian world so at the time it was a male dominated male dominated uh, system so where actually shila patrika it uh, she held some massive popularity so this is what the charter have been revealing to us then now let us discuss about the vijay aditya so he is the king he donated a village it is also mentioned in the the copper plate so the king vijay aditya he is a chalukyan ruler he ruled from 696 ce to 733 ce so his reign was marked by general peace and harmony he built a number of temples also a primary reading of the plates it actually revealed that vijay aditya had donated the village of sikateru in the kogali vishaya to a vedic scholar so sikateru is a village name and uh, today actually the sikateru have been calling it as a shigateri okay it actually locating in the vijayanagara district of karnataka so the plates had revealed about the village donations made by the chalukyas so the entire plate what they both have been researching it actually revealing about the village donations 
So in the NCRT, we might have come across the Brahmadeya. Brahmadeya means the donations what the king have been making towards the Brahmins. So it is uh, termed as a Brahmadeya. While other Balumi, uh, Badami Chalukyans, they actually were keeping the title Satya Shreya. Okay. So it means the pattern of truth. So among them, the Pulakeshin too, he was the one who actually fit for the Satya Shreya because he is very well known for the prevalence of truth in his kingdom. Okay. Because he was having some strong policing and judicial mechanisms to ensure the truth in the dynasty. And Pulakeshin too was a great grandfather of Vijayaditya. So these are all the few basic facts you should know. Now let us discuss about the Chalukyan kingdom because there were three Chalukyan dynasties that were related and distinct. So the Chalukyan kingdom it actually began in the year of 6th century AD. Okay, these are the three Chalukyan kingdoms. Chalukyas of Badami, Chalukyas of Kalyani and Chalukyas of Vengi. These Vengis are termed as a Eastern Chalukyas. And this dynasty, it was established by the Pulakeshin I in the year of 543 AD. And Pulakeshin II, we all well known, he defeated the uh, Mahendra Varma of uh, Pallava kingdom. And he also defeated the Harshavardhana from the Kanoj. The battle name was Battle of Narmada. It happened in the year of 618 uh, AD. And Pulakeshin II, he is considered to be the well-renowned king in the Chalukyas of Badami. And the region, the entire Karnataka and most of the Andhra Pradesh were under the ruling of the Badami. And the capital of Chalukyas was Badami. So that's what the, we are terming it as a Chalukyas of Badami. And the second one, the Chalukyas of Kalyani. So Western Chalukyan Empire is also known as Chalukyas of Kalyani. So this is also a yeah, Western Chalukyas. These both Chalukyas of Badami and Chalukyas of Kalyani are termed as a Western Chalukyas. And Chalukyas of Vinji alone, also, uh, they alone termed as a Eastern Chalukyas. So here, it actually emerged in the late 10th century. And their capital is Kalyani. And Vikramaditya VI is the most notable ruler. So these are the few basic facts you should know about the Chalukyas of Kalyani. And here, it is about the Eastern Chalukyas. They emerged after the death of the Pulakesin II. So the region, what they were ruling in the Eastern Deccan, it came under the Chalukyas of Venji. And the capital is Venji. Until the 11th century, they ruled over the Eastern Deccan. So these are the few basic facts you should know about the Chalukyas of uh, Chalukyan dynasty because almost three Chalukyans were there. So it may be confusing, but uh, do multiple revisions. It will be sorted out. Now with this note, let us move on to the fourth article. Rajarat to hand over patrol vessel landing craft to Maldives. So this is the article titled and India is going to hand over patrol vessels and landing crafts to Maldives. It is a part of the Sagar initiative. So Sagar, it is a term coined by the Prime Minister Modi in 2015 during his Mauritius visit. So its a main focus was blue economy. So blue economy is the main focus behind the Sagar initiative. It is a maritime initiative which gives priority to the Indian Ocean region for ensuring peace, stability and prosperity. So this is what it had been given. It is going to ensure the peace, stability and prosperity in the entire Indian Ocean region. The goal it seeks to, there are multiple goals under the Sagar initiative. So the climate of trust and transparency, then the respect for the international maritime rules and norms. Then the third one, sensitivity to each other's interest. Then the fourth one, peaceful resolution of maritime issues. Then the last one, the maritime cooperation. These are all five goals. They almost similar to the punctual uh, tenets. Okay. So it actually reflecting the ideals what we are keeping in the punctual. And with respect to the Maldives, you should know about the Operation Cactus. It happened in the year of 1987. Let me uh, discuss it very briefly. Here the Maldives is locating, right? So here Sri Lanka is there. In Sri Lanka, in the uh, mid of 1980s, several insurgent groups were operating. You all well known about the LTTE, then 
other organizations are plot eprlf so this eprlf is a pro indian insurgent group and plot they were also operating in a independent way and LTTE, you all, I think you might have known about the, the history of LTTE. So today we are not going to discuss anything about the LTTE. We are going to discuss about the plot. The plot abbreviation is People Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam. So this is the name, uh, this is the uh, uh, acronym behind the plot. And in the 1987, several plot cadres, they actually landed in the Maldives from the Kankes and Turai and Jaffna regions. So from there actually they reached the Maldives and they created a coup. So in this timeline, Ra and other military agencies, they actually aided the Maldives to resurrect the government. So this is what termed as a Operation Cactus. Okay, this is what termed as a Operation Cactus. It is actually a military operations by Indian government in the Maldives. Now let us discuss important island in the Indian Ocean region. People will be thinking that Seychelles is locating near to the Maldives. But see in this map, Maldives is locating here, Seychelles is here. And here, India is having interest in Seychelles, Mauritius, then Reunion Island. And even uh, today, we are also in, we are also encouraging the relationship with certain African countries. So Kenya, Tanzania, and Mozambique also playing crucial role in India's interest in the Indian Ocean region. Then apart from these facts, you should know about the Chagos Archipelago and Digo Gracia. Digo Gracia, where US is having a base, and in Chagos, UK is having a base. And here the Cocos Island is there and Christmas Island is there. These both islands, they belong to Australia. And two choke points are there in this region. The one is Strait of Malacca and another one is Sunda Strait. So these are all the two choke points in the Eastern Indian Ocean region. And in the Western Indian Ocean region, here we are having a choke point. Because these choke points are very important. They are actually here. Uh, they are very crucial for the international freight transports. So if there is any tension in these choke point means it will reflect in the global economy. So that's what it is very important and uh, several countries they actually eyeing on the control of these choke points. So this is, these are all the few basic facts you should know with respect to the Indian Ocean region mapping. And here the marked countries are Indian Ocean Rim Association regional cooperation countries. Okay, so in Indian Ocean Rim Association, we are having Iran, Oman, Yemen, India is there, then Kenya, Tanzania, Mozambique, South Africa, Madagascar, Mauritius, Reunion, Seychelles, then Comoros, then Australia, then from the Southeast Asian landscape, we are having Malaysia, Singapore and Indonesia. So these are all the countries who are in the Indian Ocean Rim Association organization. Now with this note, let us move on to the next article. Lives of 600 villagers set to change for better in Odisha. In Ganjam district, the district magistrate, he designated 38 unsurveyed villages to the revenue villages under the FRA Act 2006. So guys, most of the people living here are the tribal people. And because of the unsurveyed villages, people couldn't be able to get the benefits of the government schemes. They also faced difficulties in getting the birth certificates, community certificates, etc. and all. So with this notification, they will be entitled to seamless benefits from various schemes of the state and the central government. And here in this article, we are going to have a brief recap about the FRA Act 2006. FRA Act it was enacted in the year of 2006. It recognized the rights of the forest dwelling tribal communities and other traditional forest dwellers. So these communities they were dependent upon the forest for variety of needs like livelihood, then habitation, then other socio-cultural needs also. So that's what the act, uh, the government had enacted and it recognizes and vests the forest rights and occupation in forest land to the forest dwelling scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers. And in this uh, act, the government had provided key role to the Gramasabha and the Gramasabha is the authority to initiate the process of determining the 
nature and extent of individual forest rights or the community forest rights so their gram sabha they are playing two role one is related to the individual rights and the other it is related to the community rights so now we should know what are the rights we had envisioned under the fra act 2006 so title rights it gives the forest dwellers and other traditional forest dwellers the right to ownership to land um, so the individual they can have up to the maximum of 4 hectares of land as a title rights and uh, under the use rights you might have known about the forest produce right so this act actually it have been providing some uh, privileges to the forest dwellers to use their forest produce and with respect to the relief and development rights in some cases there will be a forceful eviction of tribal communities from the forest landscapes so here in this article they also talked about it and they also provided what are the measures to be taken at that time and with respect to the management rights this is the forest management rights and here the act have been talking about the inclusion of the tribals along with the forest officials in managing the resources in the forest so these are the few rights that have been talking upon now let us discuss about the significance of the fra act the first one expansion of the constitutional provisions it actually expands the mandate of fifth and sixth schedule of the constitution that protect the claim of indigenous communities over tracts of the land or forest they inhabit then the second one is related to the security concerns the alienation of tribes of the one it is the one of the major factor behind the naxal movement which affected states like chatisgarh odisha jharkhand you might have known from the pashupatinath temple to the tirupati actually pashupatinath temple it have been locating in the nepal till tirupati tirupati is in andhra pradesh so the entire corridor was termed as a red corridor so but today with the enactment of fra and plus other proactive measures we had brought down the naxal movement and this fra act it actually democratizing the forest governance because here we are recognizing the rights of the tribals who are living in the forest land for generations so therefore through this act we are democratizing uh, democratizing the uh, power of the tribes by providing key role to the gram sabhas and there are several challenges are there the first one administrative apathy as tribals are not a big vote bank you might have known so the governments find it convenient to subvert the fra act so this is one of the major concern and the second one is related to the dilution of the act certain sections of the environmentalist raised the concern that fra bends more in favor of the individual rights giving lesser scope for the community rights so this is the this is how actually they are diluting the act and the institutional roadblocks are there because we don't have any proper uh, mapping of the uh, people who are in the forest so it have been acting as a roadblocks and moreover you all will know the tribal people they don't have much uh, literacy so it have been acting as a barrier for the implementation of the schemes and all then the last one misuse of fra so fra act it have been misused uh, in a large scale especially the politicians across a party they actually interpret interpreting uh, the fra as a land distribution exercise and they have fixed targets for districts also but here with respect to the fra act we are not doing any land distribution we are just attesting the ownership of the tribal people who are living in the forest landscape so these are the few challenges you should know with respect to the fra act 2006 now with this note let us move on to the question part the first question with reference to the visible light communication technology which of the following statements are correct vlc uses electromagnetic spectrum wavelength of 375 to 780 nanometer then the second one vlc is known as a long range optical wireless communication you all well known about the visible light so it can pass to the long ranges and all vlc is used as a short range optical wireless communication okay so it is used as a optical short range optical wireless communication not as a long range optical wireless communication so the second one is wrong then vlc can transmit large amounts of data faster than the bluetooth this is true 
So their speed is between the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. They are comparatively slower than Wi-Fi, but they are very fast than Bluetooth. So the third statement is right. Then VLC has no electromagnetic interference. Visible light, they won't get uh, any disturbance due to the electromagnetic induction and all. So the fourth statement is also right. 134 is the right option for the question number one. Answer C is the right answer. This is the second question. It is related to the carbon nanotubes. They can be used as a carrier of drugs and antigens in the human body. This is true in these uh, days. The carbon nanotubes, they are also using as a axillary veins and arteries in the, the heart surgery and in brain surgery and all. Okay. Then the second one, they can be made into artificial blood capillaries for an injured part of the human body. This is also true. And they can be used in the biochemical sensors. So this is also true in certain biochemical sensors to analyze the parameters, uh, vital parameters in the human body. We are incorporating carbon nanotubes in these biochemical sensors like uh, to monitor the cholesterol, then to monitor the uh, sugar level in the blood. These biochemical sensors and all will be using the carbon nanotubes. Then the fourth one carbon nanotubes are biodegradable. This is also true. Certain nanotubes are biodegradable and certain variants are non-biodegradable. And the one what we are using for artificial blood capillaries and all non-biodegradable. But certain capillaries we will be using for a temporary time, right? So those things and all will be biodegradable. So all the statements are right. Answer option D is the right one for the question number two. Now with this note, let us wind up our discussion friends. Let me catch you in another article tomorrow. Thank you. Bye.